Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 440 Guitar Podcast. I am your host, Jarrell Powell. Thank you so much for tuning up. You can catch the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and anchor.fm forward slash 440. Uh, be sure to follow the podcast as well on Instagram at the 440 Guitar Podcast to get updates on the episodes coming out. And then also revamping the podcast this time for uh, coming back from the, the holiday and everything. So we started to do a song of the day uh, and then also just uh, cutting up on some videos for artists that I have an aspiration for that I, I'll show throughout for every day. Uh, so definitely be sure to follow, um, you know, follow the, the Instagram there. And then lastly, the website is giving it, getting an overhaul. Uh, so it's out of maintenance at the moment, but if you want to reach out to me, you can do that either through Instagram, uh, just direct message. You can send me an email at the 440 podcast.com, or you can even go to anchor.fm forward slash 440. You can leave me a voicemail as well. So however you want to do that, feel free to do so. More than welcome to. Um, so just to let you know about that. Today, I'm very excited as I have a, a guitar player that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I've been listening to for, for quite a bit uh, a time here now. And uh, this is a, uh, I wanted to provide a description for everybody. And this is from uh, Fritz Orman on Post uh, Trash. But I think he, he this description is just very very right on on point with how I feel about this guitarist as well. So it says, and quote, this this uh, guitarist is one of the only guitar heroes we have left. As innovation in guitar playing wanes in every possible niche of rock music gets its revival, he continues to be the forefront of the art. Uh, his uh, idiosyncratic uh, playing style and full embrace of all that music technology can offer has made him a standout artist, even in the technically demanding genres that his music normally falls into. From his own excellent band, uh, Terra Mellos, his collaboration with Mike Watt, Nils Klein, uh, Greg Sonier, and uh, the big walnuts yonder to his arresting guitar work on Death Grips, uh, Jenny Death. Uh, he has been called one of the most inventive guitarists of this generation. Uh, the 440 Guitar Podcast is excited to have Nick Reinhardt on the show. Nick, how are you, man? Wow. Hey, Jarrell, thank you for having me. And that was an insane... Uh, <laughs> little uh, intro there wow post trash uh, props to them that's i'm i'm blushing right now thank you so much. and yeah and, uh, and thank you for having me i'm doing good of course absolutely absolutely um i'm glad to hear that so you know definitely for you know, before we get started i mean 20 2021 right i mean we're we're almost done here with the month time's flown by and a cr you know a bunch of stuff's happened but just in general just with you you know how have you been you know, given this, this whole, you know, pandemic series that everyone's been dealing with and working on music. I know you released a new album uh, last year, which we're going to talk about in uh, detail later. But how, how have you been doing, you know, uh, since last year up to now? Yeah, um, I guess I think because I think I went to Disneyland like the first week of March before all this blew up. And that was kind of like the last fun thing I remember. And then it all just disappeared, you know, like <laughs> within a couple of weeks after that. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, just like everyone, it's been really bizarre, you yeah. know? Um, I, I, like you said, we'll get into it, but like I released this disheveled cuss record that I had been working on for a really long time. And that kept, you know, when, when the pandemic was starting, you know, it kept getting pushed back and because, you know, no one knew what was going on, right, for the first few months. So bands were rescheduling tours and then rescheduling the tour again. Yeah. And all this stuff started happening before, like, the reality sunk in, you know, six months into it or whatever. But so that was really bizarre, releasing mm -hmm. music, you know, something that I had been working on for a really long time, had a whole bunch of tours, tons of work, you know, just canceled, obviously, that did not come back in any form mm. um so it's been weird i spent i spent the first kind of a few months feeling very uh uh lethargic about mm. the whole thing not really in a creative mood um yeah you know and then kind of it kind of picked up and i got i i found my rhythm and how, how to exist you know during the pandemic and isolated sort of thing right um but yeah i mean just like i guess everyone's got their own version of it but Mine is definitely very boring. In fact, anytime <laughs> like I'm I'm catching up with a friend and they're like, Hey, how's it going? What's new? And it's like, well, I always say, I'm staying put, I'm staying healthy and staying bored. So that's <laughs> that's kind of how I, I've summed up the last just about year here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Was there, was there any, um, was there any, uh, uh, like, uh, I want to say I don't want to say reluctancy, but were, was there any like uh, as far as you releasing the album, you know, during that that time, you know, in general, as far as releasing music in general, was there any hesitation, you know, around that, or how was that for you as far as releasing music last year? Well, I think the hesitation was just not knowing, like, oh, is this thing going to go away in six mm-hmm. months, and then, you know, just there was so obviously so little information and communication and leadership about the whole thing that it was just more confusing. But, you know, when, once I realized, nope, this is what it is, you know, yeah. I, I could have sat on music for a year or two, obviously, and then kind of released it later. But then, you know, as time goes on, it just becomes less and less precious, mm. you know, and it's like, well, whatever, I'll put this out and you know, just roll with it. And that's that. So yeah. like reluctance, yes, but more just, because of ignorance and not really understanding what was going on, you mm, know. I see. Well, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting is that, you know, for some, I, I think for a lot of, at least for, for music folks like myself, you know, um, there's a lot of, I mean, of course, a lot of people had a various situations going on, you know, a lot of people having anxiety, things like that, and just trying to do something to get their mind off of everything. And music is a big thing for me on that, you know, whether it be listening to podcasts or listening to music. So I think, you know, for, for someone such as yourself, you know, releasing music, um, for, for, for last year, I think if anything, it's definitely some people really need that, you know, and I think definitely for this album, which obviously we'll talk about later, definitely one of those, one of those, uh, pieces of, of music where it's like, man, like I really needed this. Like, I didn't even know that I did that. I, that I needed it. But once I listened to it, it was like, man, like I really needed this. So that, that's really cool to hear. Yeah. And that, you know, that's really important to me. And if people, you know, uh, gain, that sort of thing from listening to the music that I make, then, you know, there's basically nothing better than that, you know, Yeah, absolutely. as an artist. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on the 440 guitar podcast, we're really big on origin stories, how people got to where they are today. Uh, So without further ado, tell me about your uh, earliest memories of music. Um, in my head, I just go back to like probably between like nine and 11 years old. Hmm. Actually, yeah, probably like Nirvana, Nirvana on the radio and like Metallica Enter Sandman. Like hmm. I remember hearing those, you know, that sort of music, rock music. I grew up in, well, Southern California, and then I migrated up to Northern California, but like listening to K-Rock as a kid in the car with my parents or whatever, and realizing like, oh, like rock music. I like rock music. You know, Mm -hmm. this is cool. Um, And, you know, being like nine years old and having Metallica ride the lightning on cassette and my mom seeing that it was parental advisory or whatever in a song about suicide or something. So she takes the tape from me and hides it somewhere. (laughs) And then I find it in like a kitchen, you know, cupboard or something. And I, I steal it back, you know, like that sort of thing, basically just being like a really young dorky kid, like hearing rock music. That's kind of the, the, when music starts to kind of um, resonate with me right around that age. So I guess, Yeah, well, uh, maybe maybe between let's say let's even say between like 7 and 9 years old. Yeah, cuz right around 1990, I guess, was probably when that stuff starts to click with me. And then mm-hmm. you know, when I guess when I'm like 11 and 12, then it's like kind of punk music and you know, Green Day and the Sex Pistols and stuff like that and you know, like when I was in 6th grade, I had a purple backpack and back then you know you would write on the sleeves with white out on, on the straps on mm. the backpack straps oh yeah so i probably had like metallica sex pistols green day nirvana like written in white out on my jansport straps you know <laughs> so that that when i think like all, all the way back that's sort of like when music really starts like popping off for me nice nice and were these, I'm assuming were, were these artists that you just kind of discovered yourself or was there, was there like uh music uh, playing in the house that you end up discovering as well? I really think it's like rate, like just 
being aware of it on the radio and mm. then you know like kind of around that era it's like it's like a golden era of MTV yeah and you know when when you get home from school and it's just right at the right time you can catch like the Soundgarden Black Hole Sun music video or Smashing Pumpkins or whoa what's this new band The Offspring with the the come right. out and play song or what you know what I mean like so it, it's not so much that I had musical parents or a musical like environment. My dad was musical. He he plays a guitar and you know he seen the Rolling Stone a zil- Rolling Stones a zillion times. Mm-hmm. But um, I think more for me, I was connecting to it just like through kind of peripherally like noticing it and just you know what I mean. It's not like my dad was like, "Hey, I want you to listen to this stuff." Like I wasn't like listening to like rock music from the second I was born. Right. You know, it was more just like, "Ooh, this is cool." You know, like what is this? Oh, rock like there's I like the way this this beat sounds and this guitar mm-hmm. sounds cool and the guy's kind of yelling right here and then, you know, like I said, then you sort of just start going down those like rabbit holes that are available to you as a 10-year-old or whatever. Right. Right. And when did, when did the, when did the guitar get put into your hands or when did you decide like, Oh, let me try to learn this thing. So, um, the story goes, my dad had a Yamaha electric guitar, which he still has. And he had like a little fender amp Mm -hmm. and a, like a four track, a Tascam four track. And so he probably showed me how to use it when I was like, maybe nine or 10 years old. Like my parents were uh, divorced. So when I'd go visit my dad's house, I'd want to play on his guitar, you know, and just kind of mess around with it and see how it works. Mm. Then uh, I guess I, I haven't like done the math properly, but Mm. it, it must've been like, I guess it was either the Christmas of 93 or 94. My stepbrother got, a guitar for Christmas when we were both 11 Mm. and I, you know, I got something, I don't know, maybe I got a video game or something that wasn't a guitar. And I just was so jealous that he got this cool electric blue Memphis Strat copy. And all I wanted to do was play his guitar. Like, Oh, let me try it. Let me try it. You know? (laughs) Um, And so shortly thereafter I went home and I told my mom, Hey, I want a guitar. You know, how do I do this? And I, I saved up money, you know, did chores, did that whole thing, and went and put one on layaway, a two hundred dollar guitar on layaway mm. at a little music shop, and I I got it before I turned twelve in May of, uh, I guess that would have been ninety five. Mm. Wait, is that no? I don't know. That's not right. May sometime in like. 90 maybe 94 i get it i don't remember but i was Mm. 11 and it was after my stepbrother got one and i was like i want that so i put (laughs) a guitar on layaway i put a little teeny like terrible terrible guitar amp on layaway and then i got a fuzz pedal Mm. and that was like my first thing so i'm basically i'm 11 years old when i'm like trying to play you know nirvana songs nice Oh man, do you recall your your journey as far as like when you started playing? Was it one of those things where it, it caught on pretty, you know, pretty quickly, or was it one of those things where you you know put it down, picked it back up? Yeah, it it was definitely a quick like, ooh, no, I really really do like this. It wasn't a sort of thing where I was taking lessons and getting bored with it. In fact, I have I have like a specific memory of maybe my parents being annoyed that I didn't want to like go outside and play and do outdoor stuff. I just wanted to stay inside and play guitar where there's like, you know, the neighborhood kids are throwing a football up and down the street or something. And I just wanted to stay inside. Um, and there was never like a slow period of me playing guitar. There, like there wasn't a year where I was like, eh, okay, I'm over this. I want to play video games now or do this or that. It was just like, as soon as I got my own guitar, it was full on. This is what I want to like, you know, be doing all the time. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Nice. Now I, I'm sure you probably had a couple of like, like, or like just like childhood bands back in the day. Do you recall like the first time you played live? Um, the, I, I actually, I remember it being a significant thing for me that I didn't like try writing any, like try writing a song until mm-hmm. maybe, I was probably maybe 14. So it was like a few years 
later that I'm like, whoa, you can like, you don't, you can just write your own songs. You don't need to like learn the Nirvana or Metallica riff. You can kind of write your own stuff. Mm. And so um, my first, you know, like, I guess gig that I played was um, some friends and I playing cover songs at our buddy's 16th birthday, I think. So maybe I would have been 15 Mm. and it was like in a backyard you know, and, mm-hmm. and then probably within the next few years, we like, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember like my first show on a stage. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably would have been about maybe, maybe 16, 16, like playing in front of people. Yeah. Cause I think maybe like my, my junior year I played at my high school mm-hmm. and, you know, like we played like a Weezer song or something. So it was right around that zone. And like, we were like, we were started kind of doing punk music. It was, it was sort of like loosely a punk band, punk poppy punk band sort of thing. So yeah. right around that era. But I think the significant takeaway of that is when I realized, Oh, you can write songs. It's not that hard to just like write your own song, you know, whereas yeah. I just, it, I, I always wish like, Oh, I, I wish I would have, started a little sooner of just like writing little dorky 12 year old riffs. That would be so neat to be able to like hear now. (laughs) Yeah. I find that really interesting too. Cause I've, you know, spoken to artists where as far as like how they, how they learn music and, and how, you know, a lot of, you know, obviously people, you know, they start with covers and everything, but then it's interesting too. When I also, I also run in and have conversations with musicians where they, they, they have trouble improvising, you know, like they have, like they, they have trouble like finding something outside of what they already know, you know? And, and I, I grew up more so doing a lot of just like improv stuff and like figuring things out and, and trying to write songs. I guess kind of similar to, you know, Tom Morello where like he grew up and he didn't, he didn't really want to play covers. He kind of wanted to do his own stuff. And if then, if, then if he decided he wanted to, play covers afterwards you know that he would do that do you do you think for yourself like how, how important do you think it is as far as having that ground road of like like in, like being able to really discover the guitar for through improv improvisation or your own music versus like playing covers well i mean i guess it just depends on you know like what going through your head because you mm-hmm. know like how you asked was it was playing guitar like did it take quickly Mm. and it did and it was all i wanted to be doing whereas you know if you're like i don't know a teenager that oh i'd like to get a guitar i think i'll ask for a guitar for christmas and then you get a guitar and it's like cool now the household has a guitar Mm. maybe that's like just what you want to do you want to sit around and like learn how to play like you know songs on an acoustic guitar that like you know, you can sing along to or whatever. It's just like a different path, you know? True. But for me, it like, it was really important to, you know, make friends with someone in the neighborhood that had a drum set and then Mm. bring my crappy guitar amp over and like, Oh, we could, we could play this green day song. It's really not that hard. Mm. Well, all right, maybe we could do like our own version of that. Let's make our own song. You know what I mean? And then, then when you realize that's a thing that you can do that there aren't like rules to. And it's just, it's really not that difficult. Then all of a sudden you've opened so many doors, you know, Mm. like, and at, at that age, you're just like, it's kind of fun and funny, you know, to just like, Oh yeah, Saturday, let's come over and jam around. But really it's, that's like, you know, you're, you're like becoming an artist. You know what mm. I mean? You're like, you're, you're paving that path for yourself that, that you don't even realize that that's what's happening, you know? Right. So for me, that's, that was incredibly important to like go down the path of, I guess, like, I mean, you're really just improvising your way through learning an instrument and learning to write songs and right. kind of finding out what your, you know, your personality is going to be, you know? Mm. Interesting. De- right. Developing it, you know, at that age, so that was like it, like very important for myself. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Did you have any? Um, did, did you have any like certain guitar players that you kind of held like held as like the the golden standard for yourself, or just some of like your favorite guitar players that really helped create you know create that personality for you on guitar that that you that you just you know were a big fan of? Yeah, I mean, well. <laughs> you can't really be 
a 12 year old in the mid nineties and not, you know, love Kurt Cobain. Like that yeah. was everyone's guitar hero, anti guitar hero, you know? Yeah. Um, but I also remember you mentioned Tom Morello. I remember being at like a summer camp in sixth grade and someone maybe showing someone had a, a kid had a rage against the machine shirt, which mm. I know that sounds insane in sixth grade and like 1993 or four or whatever, whatever year that is to like for someone to be wearing a rage against the machine shirt at summer camp but yeah this is real mm. i remember it was an orange one it was orange and it had like the the classic text across it um and i think maybe he showed me rage and like that guitar playing was amazing to me and i remember yeah. i learned all those tried to learn all those guitar parts and then eventually got a bass or borrowed a bass from a friend because i really liked the bass playing in that band and i learned all the bass stuff which is funny because the bass basically is the guitar part on, yeah <laughs> on the first rage against the machine record yeah. uh for for most of it so but yeah so kurt cobain uh tom morello i guess um and then just like it was more yeah like i saw sonic youth when i was I think 12 with my dad at Lollapalooza. And that was a really big deal. Like, whoa, these guys are awesome. And so then I start listening to that and really, really enjoy the guitar playing in that band, you know? Yeah. So just like punky stuff. And I guess, you know, all, all the stuff that's kind of surrounding you, like I said, in the like MTV era, mm. you know, of being a kid in the mid nineties, that's, that's the guitar playing that I liked all of it, you know? Nice. Nice. And then talk to me a little bit about obviously you know you're in a you're in a effects guru you know as, and then as far as it's like you know playing with with different pedals and effects and, and one thing I find really interesting with your playing is that you know it's not like you're just playing you're just playing through a bunch of pedals just like to test it out it's almost like you 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 try to it's almost like you strategically change how you play with these pedals like it almost like it's almost as if you change your guitar technique to complement the sound or the for, for for the type of effect and pedal that you're that, that you're playing which i find really interesting um when did you really start getting into you know different pedal uh, effects as you were you know playing guitar yeah um i think that's a pretty accurate way of kind of like looking at how i approach um playing with all these you know lots of pedals is it you're right it does make me reapproach how i'm playing guitar because i'm not just like i want to turn on this effect right now to like emphasize the guitar solo or something like yeah as sort of obvious as it is the pedal board is like its own instrument mm -hmm. in a way you know so it's kind of like you're playing two instruments at once um simultaneously and they affect one another so of course you need to readjust how you're how you're performing on yeah. each one, you know, um, at the beginning of Terra Mellos, I had, I had a, a, a delay pedal, a Digitech synth wah, probably some, some sort of overdrive or something. And then I think a phaser pedal and a mm -hmm. tuner. So basically, you know, like a very, very small little, um, pedal board, which was just a piece of wood with Velcro on it, you know, and everything kind of like Velcroed to this little shelf thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, and it, it was more just like, oh yeah. Uh, so I guess I would have been, I don't know, maybe 23 around that time. Mm -hmm. And I had just collected some pedals, you know, over the years, I maybe had like less than 10 pedals or something. And it was just fun to kind of, in the band that we were starting, which was kind of a different odd sounding band. We had all this, you know, sort of different influences and sonically we're trying new things for us. We, we had all come from like punk and hardcore bands and, you know, then we're like, well, let's try and do something a little different, um, you know, with this new thing. And sonically we, we realized we could do something different, like physically the way it sounds by using these pedals, you know, and also like bringing in the different influences, you know, beyond just punk and hardcore stuff. Like I was really into um, getting into electronic based music and a lot of that stuff uses all sorts of, you know, non-traditional sounds you wouldn't hear mm. coming out of a guitar, generally speaking. Yeah. So then when you kind of figure out how you can maybe emulate some of those sounds, 
through guitar effect pedals then all of a sudden you get it like i became like addicted to it and that was really really exciting for me and then mm. eventually kind of start um repurposing like how i was playing guitar kind of going back to what we were saying like yeah. oh yeah this is like a part of my guitar personality you know what i mean to like be making these sounds and doing all these like you know sonic acrobatics with a big pedal board that just yeah. sort of got ingrained into my dna at that point yeah yeah because i remember i remember watching a i want to say it was like a guitar rig uh where, where you were showing just like you know one of your setups and then just like how you were how you were like you, you were you're were, you were pressing like a bunch of switches on different effects on different parts and different songs i'm like oh my i was like that that is so hard to i can only imagine during a live setting <laughs> yeah you know? like, yeah holy yeah cow like but uh, again that in like the in the in the early days of terra Mellos, when we start you know we practiced a lot like that band we would try and practice like five or six days a week we oh, like wow. we just that's what we wanted to do we just so any day that you know all four of us could get in a room and practice we were like all right let's practice you know so a lot of like the physical movement of all that stuff you know we kind of figured out how to do that too mm -hmm. so um yeah it just sort of became second nature to incorporate that sort of thing into the songs that we were creating hmm. wow yeah I, i'm a huge uh there's you know a bunch of different songs on tiramelis that just really like connected with me i was like gosh this is so like good and like because I, I i'm a big fan of um omar rodriguez lopez and uh you know i i, I there's a there's certain similarities that for reasons why i i love his playing and him as an artist and then you playing and you as an artist like there's just different types of styles that are that, that that are dove into you know where like i'll hear different riffs that remind me of like uh like eight bit video game like an eight bit sound video game or just yeah. like certain serialism and things of that of that of that nature like as far as like creating those songs with tara Mellis, um was there a like like how was that process as far as you guys working on songs did you guys have a general process as far as like, okay you come in with this we'll work on it or was it more of like everyone kind of contributes or is it just like a mixed bag of everything? It's, it's definitely evolved over the years. Cause when we were first, you know, starting our band in like 2004 ish, it was like a lot of jamming, mm. you know? And then like, well, what could come after that? Well, this guitar player has this idea. All right, let's jam that for a little bit. That sounds cool. Now, how do we like combine these two parts, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, and then, over the years it just sort of evolves and you know there's member changes and this whole thing um and also I, I think generally as i get older i really do not like jamming i don't want to especially because when we were writing that sort of music that's really technical and fast and yeah. very nuanced it takes a long time So if I brought in this bizarre riff that has all these changes and really specific little things, it's not like we, we play it for 15 minutes and like, all right, cool, let's go to the next part. Mm. I remember with like a, a Tara Mellos riff where we were jamming, like working on like 45 seconds of music for like months. Wow. You know? yeah, and it was just like, ah, oh, this is this is ridiculous. You know, like, and I, I feel like I just have like, post-traumatic stress disorder from like that era of the band which i think was around 2007 i feel like and, mm -hmm. and that's when i i feel like it clicked in my head like i don't want to do this i don't want to waste hours in a practice spot like like figuring out these patterns and like what sounds best until it clicks you know yeah. so eventually you know kind of kind of where it it's landed is i will you know c come up with a lot of guitar parts that i like and sequence them into something that resembles a song mm. demo that 
And instead of jamming that in a practice spot with the drummer for hours and hours, weeks and weeks, it's like, hey, here's the the track. It's I can kind of, you know, maybe it's to a click or maybe it's not or whatever, but like just take this and jam it by yourself, you know. So we don't have to waste the time, all of us, you know, having booked flights and, you know, booked a practice room and lugged our gear into a practice spot just to like work this out. Like, you know, it, right. it became way more convenient just to do it on our own. So that's, that's where it, it landed. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's me sort of stringing, I don't know, maybe three or four guitar parts together generally with all of us knowing, okay, this, this probably changes at some point, but let's just like get the gist of it down to where we're all happy. Then we could, you know, get together and start playing and see where it goes from there. Yeah, because I think I remember watching something where um, you were talking to uh, the the host of, of, of whichever performance or show that was. But as far as like how you like your a lot of your band members were spread out, like 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 across like like different countries, and then you guys had to you know come together and you know uh, you guys like practice for twelve days before being able to to record or something of that nature and being able to 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 kind of work on songs at a, at a distance. I'm not sure if it was the most, if it was the last record you guys, you guys made, but I just thought that was really, really interesting, you know? And then, and then obviously you guys working to get, you guys have, you know, played together for so long. There's that instinct factor too. Right. So if you guys playing different changes, you know, like it, it feels, it, it feels intended even maybe if it isn't, you know, do yeah. you, do, you know, do, do you kind of yeah. feel that with your band? I do. I do. I think, um, I think that musical language that we speak, I don't think it is always acknowledged, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if by someone that sees us live or listens to us, but you know, like you're bringing it up, like, I love when people catch on to that because if, if we were to play a show or whatever, well, at least a, a couple of years ago, right now, it, it would probably it would take us a long time. I like to practice. I want to practice like two weeks back to back, like every day before we like play a show. I would even want more than two weeks because I want it to, I want, I want it to sound like, Oh my God, this is psychotic. What these guys are doing right now. Like they're, (laughs) these stops are airtight. The sound is so perfectly placed. You know what I mean? That's how I want it to be when we play live. Um, so, so yeah, so it takes a really long time for me to get comfortable. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the process of practicing would be maybe we got to figure out what songs we want to play in the set. Okay, cool. We have these nine songs. Now we have to play them individually, you know, a zillion times to get them sounding good, you know, cause w- I have a new pedal board built. I built a new pedal board, you know, just about every two or ever consisted of a new setup for me. And then, you know, you transition the songs together and you build the set. Then you practice the set a bunch of times. Then when you're feeling comfortable with how it's all laid out, then you get into like the nuances of things like, ah, wait, how about we put like an extra like three seconds in this part? So it's kind of like it's got a different feel to it. You know, a three second like silence or break or something, you know. Mm. So there's also all those little things that we would take into account, which lead to, like I said, at least like... I would always probably like, you know, really try and push for like two weeks of practicing and it would probably generally turn into like nine or 10 days, you know, because we just couldn't like pull that off. But yeah, I for that band in particular, I've never practiced with any other band that did that. But for for Terramelos, it's like, no, that's the thing. We got to get it like so insanely tight and purposeful so that you know, years down the line when I'm on a, the 440 guitar podcast, you're like, Hey, what about that? I noticed that. And I'm like, finally, someone noticed it. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad we put in like hours and hours of practice. So, you know, people will notice it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, man. So tell me about disheveled cuss that, uh, you released, uh, that, that album, uh, self-titled is the, you know, the new band, uh, Tell me a little bit as far as kind of the emergence of that sound and, 
you know, wanting to produce uh, you know, an album like that? I've been kind of just messing with those types of songs by myself. You know, some of those songs on that record go back to, I think, 2009 mm-hmm. that I demoed. And then I think there's even a couple of riffs that go back to like 2006 that I have maybe on a cassette tape somewhere. So it's just, it's always been something that I was interested in. And that, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, that's the kind of music that I grew up on, you mm-hmm. know, like that's what I'm referencing in those songs is like, oh yeah, the thing, the music that made me who I am, that set me on the path. I want to like, I want to be able to express that in a project. And there's some Terramello stuff over the years that I have pulled from that, um, that source, you know, mm-hmm. there's a couple songs on x out, uh, the song, new chlorine and there's a song called tropic lame those were both like in my demo pile for what would become disheveled cuss so it's existed for a really long time but i just i didn't think it was fair to this batch of songs that i had to just kind of like i wanted them to have their own thing i didn't want them to just slowly be filtered into terramellos and tweaked to be this like new weird thing you know yeah so i'd been messing with it for a really long time and then through i guess after I think we, the last Terramellos tour was uh, December, I think 2018. And we got back and I just realized it was going to be a while before we'd be able to do anything if we end up doing anything again at some point. Mm -hmm. So I I decided, okay, I want to dedicate, I want to finish this. I just want to finish it. I don't even know if I'll put it out. There, There was a second where I'm like, oh no, what do I do with this? You know, Mm. uh, maybe it just sits on a hard drive forever or whatever, but yeah, it had been brewing for a long time. I had the time and potential dedication to finish it. And then once I kind of set my mind to it, I was really excited about it. And it became this, you know, this thing. And at that point, it wasn't even a bit ba- like I didn't even have a name for it. I, it was just like a concept in my head, you know, and then all of a sudden there's a record done. And then I have this name and then, you know, like, okay, let's, let's go play some shows and let's turn it into a thing, you know, so... Yeah, it was a, a fun, very long uh, road to get to this point. Before I go into, I guess, a couple of the songs that I wanted to ask you about, but as far as with the name Disheveled Cuss, what, what, what was the origin of that concept or that name? <laughs> I don't... Naming bands, to me, is probably, like, the least exciting part of <laughs> being in a band. It's so stressful to me, you know, yeah. like, I, when we start... When we when we named Terramelos, I remember at the time, the concept was, let's come up with a name that... Um, on paper or just reading it or hearing it, there's no indication of what the band sounds like or looks like, mm. or, you know, there's no ties to it. It's like a, a, a very random sounding name. Um, and I thought at the time that was really cool. I even saying that out loud now, I still think that's a cool idea. Oh yeah. But you know, for years, it's like a name that's hard to pronounce. By the way, you, you say it perfectly. Thank you. Respect. Terramellos. Oh. Okay. Just like people say I've been correcting people on how to say that the band name for 15 years now. You know, oh, wow. it's just like I, so I guess I'm just sort of like scarred from band names. Um mm. and I really didn't r- know what to name this new thing. Uh disheveled cuss, I feel disheveled. I I've kind of like always had a disheveled slovenly like uh <laughs> appearance maybe i don't mm. know uh i just really like the way that word sound and something sounded and something about um those two words combined like a disheveled cuss to me well cuss can mean either like a swear word or you know a cuss like um uh a snotty brat you know yeah, yeah. like whatever the origin of that that word is but something about the phrase a disheveled cuss sounds like something that Van Dyke Parks, um, famous, you know, um, 
songwriter, mm-hmm. you know, millions of other things. He's one of my favorites. Van Dyke Parks. It sounds like, and he's a total wordsmith. And mm-hmm. I love hearing Van Dyke Parks talk or sing or read read stuff he's written. Um, and it just it reminded me almost of something that like Van Dyke Parks would say, like mm-hmm. in a really poetic, interesting way. So, and I don't know. Yeah, again, naming bands, uh, it's it's really difficult for me but i thought it had a nice ring to it and it's kind of weird and you know so i don't know May, i might you know maybe in 15 years i might be like uh why did i name this thing that? <laughs> you know but i think r- right now i'm happy with it i like it yeah 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 I, I like it too definitely a unique uh unique ring to it you know so i i dig it tell me about um were there any songs on the album that i guess uh were most memorable to finally create uh, that you've had, you know, sitting for, for so long. I know like one of the songs that I was a really big fan of uh, listening to was, Oh my God. I love yeah. that song. So good. So, so yeah. Good. Thank you. That That's, that's one of like, um, that one has existed for a long time. That's like when I would picture the band, like playing live or thinking about it for years, or like playing my guitar by myself in my bedroom, that was the one that I just pictured like existing as a song for this new band. Like that's the new band, this song, this guitar riff, like Mm -hmm. this is the vibe that I want, you know? So that one, yeah, for sure. That's an important one to me. Structurally, I think it's really interesting. It's actually, that's probably like, you know, maybe the the quote unquote weirdest song on the record, just because there's like the long bridge section that kind of noises out and kind of does like a sonic youthy thing and feedback and all this, this sort of stuff, you know, as opposed to some of the other like poppy, you know, quote unquote normal sounding songs on the record. But yeah, I really love that one. Uh, the song New Complication that's a song that I demoed in 2009 when I was living in Hollywood. Uh, I remember demoing it in my bedroom and being like, Oh yeah, look, <laughs> kind of like when I was a kid, like I could write just songs by myself and like that aren't Taramelis related. And this sounds pretty good to me. It's just like a, a, like a very simple sounding pop song. And funny enough, I emailed that to the record label at the time, like, Hey, check this out. Uh, this label Sergeant House that Tara Mellos is on mm. I, I wrote them saying hey I've got this like new song you know and I'm just uh, seeing what you guys think of it you know and I never heard back from them they literally did not respond to that email oh, wow. which I just thought was funny <laughs> so and, and even like before we had um, when we talked about them releasing this last record I mentioned that and they're like what you sent this to us what do you mean i'm like well yeah i did and they didn't believe me mm-hmm. and i had i still had the email and i pulled it up and showed it to him like see here it is right here you did not respond to it <laughs> <laughs> so so uh that that song in my head new uh what became new complication that is kind of the song that started me wanting to make that record you know 10 years ago basically nice wow wow do you feel that for the for the album? I mean, since there's so many years in the you know in the making, whether intentionally or not intentionally, do do you feel that that the painting came out the way that you wanted it to come out for this record? I think so. Um, I haven't listened to it for a while, mm. um, but for for a first record that i had been wanting to make for a really long time uh that was you know self funded that i made with a friend and kept telling him like hey i can't pay you i can't pay you i'll try and pay you later but right now can you please just do me this favor <laughs> you know um i think all things considered and uh, you know i uh my friend jr kurtz played drums on it and he and i had been jamming these songs for a while i, I guess the way i look at disheveled cuss is it's it's my thing. And I think what it will just turn into is, you know, I can kind of do whatever I want with this thing. In other words, I, I wanted to give it a name, right? It's not just Nick Reinhardt as a solo artist. It's, it's me under this banner. 
but JR has been playing drums with me since I've like for like probably three years, three or four years now since I've been like thinking on it. Actually, no, more like he and I have been jamming. I had shown him this batch of songs maybe five years ago now oh, uh, wow. that we were jamming at a practice spot. Um, so, so anyways, um, he came and recorded it with me and played drums and then Pat Hills engineered it, played bass on it. And then I did everything else. And yeah, I think, I think it came out exactly what, how I was picturing and I'm awesome. proud of it. There's like, I don't, I, there's nothing I would change about it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm, I was glad to finally like make it a real thing and just have it exist Awesome. Out, outside of my own head. You know? Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I always feel like that's kind of like the, just like kind of the sweetest thing, you know, when when what whatever's in your head that you're able to, to to actually you know hear it and and it's a you know and it and it being finished. So I think that's that's definitely a a great thing there. I I agree. Yeah, that 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 is an important thing, mm -hmm. uh, just to get it to get it out. You know, that's that's a big accomplishment for an artist. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always always remember hearing, um, you know, Jimi Hendrix saying that you know this is these sounds in his head that he's trying to get out and get into the guitar, you know, and really hearing that. So just that's definitely something that I I, I really can relate to. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, you know, of course, you know this this is a great album. I have to get it on vinyl soon if if it's available on vinyl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it is. I have one copy. Otherwise I'd send you one. I have my, <laughs> I have my, my copy. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. It, you it, gotta have your copy. <laughs> anyone's out there listening to this. I believe it is available through hello merch. Oh, cool. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so any, anything planning in the, anything in the future is planned for, for 2021, anything planned for you? Yeah, well, I so earlier in our conversation, I mentioned that I was very bored through COVID and kind of um, lethargic about the whole thing. And at some point, I was like, "Well, all right, I want I want to have done something during this era." So I was like, "Well, I have this. Well, I released the disheveled cuss record, so maybe I can kind of work on something else under that, um, you know, name, idea, concept." Yeah. So I I have been uh recording i'm working on a record a second record that i as of right now i it's a disheveled cuss record i guess anything could happen but um nice. yeah it's a little differently sonically than uh the first one um but yeah that's that's a thing and i'm i'm hoping that i can have that finished uh in the next few months here and i you know i was just I've been thinking a lot lately just about releasing music and how bands and artists are doing it and just how different it is now that, you know, we're in the COVID era and it's probably not going away for a while. Yeah. Um, so what that, what it means to release music and how you approach that and how you do that. So almost as much as like making the record that I'm working on right now, I'm already thinking about like, wow, how do you, how do you release a record now? You know what I mean? Like, yeah as a, as a very small, like, you know, independent artist, what does it mean to release music? And, you know, like I, I can't really work. Obviously I, I don't really earn a lot of money anymore making playing music because a lot of that, you know, comes from live performance, of course. Yeah. So, so how do you make money releasing music? You know, and I, I guess now I'm just sort of like starting to think about a lot of that stuff. So the, mm -hmm. the release itself is almost like this whole other layer that I need to, to figure out, but I am hoping that that could happen in uh, this year. Nice. Well, looking forward to anything that you're going to be releasing in the future. Uh, Nick Reinhardt, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Of course. Well, there you have it, folks. This is Drill Powell from the 440 Guitar Podcast. We'll jam again soon and have a good day.